Here's the brief news from the world over this week. The United States is again at war in the Middle East. Speaking at the United Nations General Assembly on Wednesday, President Barack Obama vowed to lead a coalition to dismantle the Islamic State. The president's remarks came as the U.S. expanded airstrikes against the Islamic State group in both Iraq and Syria. A coalition of five Arab nations joined the U.S. for the strikes in Syria, including Bahrain, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. It is the beginning of what the U.S. said would be a years-long battle to defeat ISIS. The president did stipulate that ultimately the U.S. cannot eliminate the threat of terrorism on its own. Now, ultimately, the task of rejecting sectarianism and rejecting extremism is a generational task and a task for the people of the Middle East themselves. No external power can bring about a transformation of hearts and minds. More on ISIS in our next segment. And the first wave of airstrikes in Syria did not target ISIS alone. The U.S. announced it had struck at the command and control centers of an al-Qaeda-linked group known as Khorasan. According to military sources, the group was close to developing an explosive device undetectable to airport security. U.S. Lieutenant General William C. Mayville of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The of our strikes. But we've been watching this group closely for some time. You know, we believe the Corazon group is, was nearing the execution phase of an attack either in Europe or the homeland. We know that the Corazon group has attempted to recruit Westerners to serve as operatives. Meanwhile, ISIS has executed another Westerner, this time a Frenchman in Algeria. The Algerian splinter group of Al-Qaeda has beheaded hostage Hervé Gordel as a gruesome response to airstrikes on the Islamic State. A visibly upset French President François Hollande called the killing a cowardly assassination Wednesday at the United Nations General Assembly. He vowed to continue the military operation. This past Friday, France joined the U.S. in conducting airstrikes on the Islamic State in Iraq. Two days later, Islamic State called on Muslims around the world to attack foreign targets. In Nigeria, there is growing concern over another jihadi group, Boko Haram, which we've been reporting on for years. Bishop Oliver Domi this week compared the savagery of Boko Haram to that of the Islamic State. He said the jihadists now control 25 towns in northeastern Nigeria. Bishop Domi is among thousands of refugees who fled their homes to evade the terrorists. He told the Nigerian Daily this day that most of the refugees in his area escaped being murdered, but many families were separated. Parents have lost children, and a humanitarian crisis is underway. Thousands, he said, are living in caves on the mountains, some in the forest. Thousands have managed to escape into Cameroon and are living under very difficult conditions. They lack food, shelter, and medication. A small spot of good news, and it's very small, after false rumors that the government had arranged the release of those schoolgirls kidnapped earlier this year, Boko Haram did release one schoolgirl. The girl appeared to be traumatized and suffering from a nervous breakdown. As world leaders gathered at the United Nations to discuss the Ebola crisis, U.S. health officials are warning that the epidemic in West Africa could explode to at least 1.4 million infected people by January. The Centers for Disease Control believes Ebola has infected more than 5,800 people in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Nigeria, and Senegal. Of those, 2,800 have died. Now, these are only the known cases. Back at the UN, Margaret Chan, director of the World Health Organization, offered her own grim assessment and implored world leaders to act. We should expect things to get worse before getting better. People will continue to struggle for survival. And unfortunately, some will die. 
in a humane world, we cannot allow the people in West Africa to suffer so much. Excellencies, you hold the power to turn this horrific epidemic around, and I appeal to you to do more. And in a bizarre story, Germany's Ethics Council is calling for the decriminalization of incest between adult siblings. In a 14 to 9 vote, the government panel opined, quote, in the case of consensual incest among adult siblings, neither the fear of negative consequences for the family nor the possibility of the birth of children from such incestuous relationships can justify a criminal prohibition. The fundamental right of adult siblings to sexual self-determination has more weight than the abstract protection of the family, end quote. The council made the decision after examining a case involving a half-brother and sister who've had four children together. The brother, who is now serving a prison term for incest, was given up for adoption as an infant and apparently didn't meet his sister until their 20s. The Vatican has opened a criminal trial against its former ambassador to the Dominican Republic for the sexual abuse of minors. The former Archbishop Joseph Wesolowski was recalled by Pope Francis last year after allegedly paying boys to perform a sexual act. It is the first time a high-ranking Vatican official has faced criminal charges for abuse. He's been placed under house arrest due to an unnamed medical condition, according to the Vatican. The church's canonical court found Wesolowski guilty of sexual abuse earlier this year and imposed the toughest penalty under canon law. He was stripped of his priestly faculties and laicized. Wesolowski could also face criminal charges in the Dominican Republic and in his native Poland. And a major U.S. appointment by Pope Francis, the Holy Father selected a new leader for the Archdiocese of Chicago, Spokane Bishop Blaise Supich. He'll be replacing retiring Cardinal Francis George. The appointment to the premier Archdiocese of the Midwest was surprising in so much as Bishop Supich is the first non-Archbishop to be named to the post in 99 years. Even he was surprised when the papal nuncio called to share the appointment. Uh, Archbishop Vigano uh, called me and uh, began the conversation by saying, um, uh, I have great news for you. And he sounded like the angel Gabriel. And so the, the, the word that, the line that came to me was, how can this be? Supish is generally viewed as a prelate who will defend church teaching when it's necessary, but prefers dialogue over confrontation. He will officially take over the diocese in November. We wish him the best in his new post, as well as Cardinal George, who's continuing a long bout with cancer. Our prayers are with both of them. And whenever a relatively unknown bishop comes to a new diocese, his record is scrutinized. Bishop Supich is no exception. LifeSite News reported that just prior to the announcement in Chicago, Bishop Supich was privately discouraging priests and seminarians in Spokane from taking part in abortion clinic prayer vigils during this year's 40 Days of Life campaign. It began on Wednesday. A statement from the diocese this past Friday clarified the bishop's position. It said that priests could participate, but should place emphasis on education and not confrontational tactics. He was also asked about the controversy at the Chicago, by the Chicago yes, media, rather, during his introduction. I've always supported the rights of people to express themselves. I think that uh, public manifestations of those sorts to express uh, one's views uh, in a peaceful way uh, is very important. And I think it all, we always have to look, too, at how we make sure that those are done uh, that really produce something in the long run. Liturgically, it's been reported that Bishop Supich barred devotees of the traditional Latin Mass from celebrating the Easter Tridium liturgies when he was in Rapid City a decade ago. According to local reports, the faithful were literally locked out of the church in which they had celebrated the Old Rite for 12 years. At the time, Bishop Supich said the decision was an invitation to unity in worship throughout the diocese. Also, while in Rapid City, the bishop decided to change the liturgical norm to a posture of standing throughout the communion rite of the Mass. 
His successor, Bishop Robert Gruss, changed the norm back to kneeling not long after his arrival. And talks between the Holy See and the breakaway traditionalist group, the Society of St. Pius X, have resumed. Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei, which is charged with handling relations with SSPX, met this week with its superior, Bishop Bernard Fillet. The two-hour meeting was the first between the two sides since the Society rejected a 2012 Vatican proposal that would have brought the group into full communion with Rome. At issue, the group's adherence to certain church teachings and doctrinal matters that came out of Vatican II, including acceptance of the Novus Ordo Mass as legitimate. The Vatican said they will gradually overcome difficulties with a view to the envisioned full reconciliation. And it was announced this week that Pope Francis has created a special commission to study reforming the process of obtaining marriage annulments. According to the Vatican release, the Pope had directed the commission in August to focus on preparing a proposal for reforming the annulment process that would, quote, simplify and streamline the procedure while safeguarding the principle of the indissoluble nature of marriage. The Synod of Bishops on the Family will gather in Rome next month to consider this issue, among others. The world over will be there in the lead-up to bring you full coverage of the event. And is the influence of religion waning in the public square? According to the Pew Research Center, Americans overwhelmingly say, yes, it is. Nearly three-quarters of those surveyed said religious influence in public life was dwindling, and most saw that as a negative trend. That's up five points from 2010. Among half of respondents said churches and houses of worship should speak out more on public issues. The same survey found that support for same-sex marriage has declined and no longer enjoys a majority of support. Regarding the Obama administration, just 30 percent of respondents agreed that the president was friendly toward religion. That's down 9 percent from 2009 and down 19 percent among Catholics and evangelicals.